We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we're diving into a little bit of F101 um, and some F1 uh, history today. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, dive into F1 Academy. I'm very excited for this episode. I think we've been, we've both kind of been waiting to do this one. We finally have time and leading up to their, you know, last race of the season and our COTA um, preview. I think this is a, a great time to do it. Yeah, I, I've been keeping an eye on the F1 Academy pretty much since they announced it. And I'm just like dying for more information. And they like very rarely put out new, new content. I'm just like, please give me something like this. Is, it's, it's driving me crazy. It's like, I know that it's they've horrible. been doing this for about five minutes, but I'm like, I'm impatient and I need this in front of me now. Yeah, and I'm very excited for the idea of the F1 Academy. It is a newer concept, but like Catherine was saying, it's so hard to find information on it, which has kind of deterred me from being a true, you know, following fan week after week. So seeing one of their races broadcast, um, if you were listening to our episode last week for or one of the uh, Qatar Grand Prix recap episode, we yeah. let you guys know that they were going to be um, broadcasting the last race of the season for F1 Academy, which I'm super excited to watch it. Um, but we were also saying like, you have to go down a deep, deep rabbit hole just to find like small little snippets of a recap. So, um, I'm really excited that we get to share this, you know, um, with you in our F101 series and hopefully we can, you know, kind of grow some more other, uh, fans as well. So, Yeah. So first off, let's get back into what is F101. We haven't released an F101 episode in a while. 101 is our educational series. We've been a little busy, um, but it's our educational series um, helping you understand the history and the fundamentals of Formula One. Um, and basically, we are doing the research so you don't have to. Um, and why we chose the F1 Academy, as we said, is we're, you know, we, we're women. We worked in sports. We work in sports. Um, and the topic of, you know, growing the f- women's presence in motorsport is one of the driving, you know, factors behind our podcast. And so we really, you know, it, it's very important to us. It's one of our fundamentals. And we're here to share all that information with you so that you can learn about it and you can love it and you can move forward with us um, and be just as entertained by it as we are. Exactly. So welcome to our F101 on the F1 Academy. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. So I, like I said earlier, I am, you know, a newer fan to um, F1 in general and also F1 Academy is a newer concept. I have not been following it as closely as Catherine. So Catherine is kind of going to educate me a little bit more as well as you guys. Um, I do have some knowledge. I'm, you know, privy to women in motorsport, but Catherine has much more knowledge. So it's going to be kind of fun to like interview style Catherine here a little bit. (laughs) So um, Catherine, for us to kind of start, let's take a step back and just look at, you know, women in Formula One in history. So who are the ones that really stand out to you in F1 that like come to your mind or that are ones that women that you think are important for people to know about in F1? Okay, so there really haven't been a lot of female F1 drivers. We've had Formula One since, uh, what, 1950. Um, And we've had five women, the most recently in 1992. But I wanted to highlight the two Formula One drivers who actually started F1 races. And they both raced... A, a minute ago, um, we've got um, Maria Teresa de Filippis, I think I pronounced her name right, and Lella Lombardi, who's the probably the most well-known female Formula One driver because she actually scored points. Um, but de Filippis, she was the first one in the 1950s. She had three starts. Lombardi had 12. Um, what really stands out to me when I was doing my research for this, for de, um, de Filippis, was um, she was not allowed to compete in the 1950s eight French Grand Prix um, because the race director at the time allegedly said that the only helmet a woman should wear is one of the hairdressers which that's real classy right that's a 
I just don't have words for that, and I'm not going to respond to it. One, it happened in the, you know, 1950s, but also it's stupid. So it does not yeah. get a response from me. <laughs> exactly. I, ha- I, had to, I had to mention it, but it's still dumb. Um, but, yeah, so we, we've had a few women, but back, you know, there used to be a more um, difficult qualifying process, I, I think. Um, I think it was more difficult because you actually had to qualify. Um, and if you didn't qualify, you didn't race. So we've had times in modern F1 where we've had drivers who haven't, you know, who, who DNF'd in, or, or couldn't start in qualifying, but were able to get a waiver from the FIA to, to start a race. Back in the day, that didn't happen. So you have, you know, these drivers who have, you know, attempted, let me, let me pull it up real quick. So we've got, um, Lombardi, um, she entered 17 races, but only started 12. Um, so the, and the other three drivers, they entered a combined seven races, but didn't get any starts. Um, so back then it was a lot harder to get yourself into the actual qualifiers for the race. Yeah, exactly. So then kind of taking a step forward and again, not getting to F1 Academy yet, but just in general for people's general knowledge, do we have any women associated with F1 teams now or has, you know, what is going on there? I think um, if any of you were watching the Qatar Grand Prix, you saw um, Jessica Hawkins uh, with Aston Martin, but is there anyone else? And Catherine, do you want to go into some detail there about Jessica's role within Aston Martin? Yeah, so Jessica um, is a driver ambassador for Aston Martin, and she was a former W Series driver, which we'll talk about the W Series in a minute because that's just a whole adventure of a of a, of a thing. Um, a but yeah, so her, if you will, it it, it 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 really was, especially this this past year. Um, but yeah, Hawkins um, what is is a a representative of Aston Martin, um, and she had the opportunity to drive one of the older Aston Martin cars at the Hungaro ring a, about a week or a couple weeks ago um and it was actually really really exciting so she she's one of the the um development drivers we've also have former w series champion jamie chadwick who is currently driving an indy next um who is also currently a member of the williams driver academy so she has been in f1 cars with williams and our favorite and we'll talk about her a lot more in a little bit but the current managing director of the f1 of the formula one academy uh suzy Wolf, who is the wife of Mercedes team boss Toto Wolf, um, she was also a development driver for Williams, and she had uh, appeared in a couple of practice sessions for F1 races while she was working with the team. So we've had a number of them. We don't see them very often, but hopefully we will be seeing more of them soon. Um, we currently have a female driver in F3, Sophia Florsch, um, who is um, working her way through the series um, in the similar way that the F1 Academy um, wants drivers to make their way through and ultimately get to F1. Okay. Okay. So there are currently women within F1, but we also, you know, like we mentioned earlier, the W series had a, you know, all women series. We say we had because it's no longer around the um, F or F1 Academy has now replaced the W series essentially as the, all female, not league, but circuit of um, motorsport. So, do you want to go into some details of the roller coaster that was the W Series? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, it was announced in 2018 and had its first season in 2019. It ran for, I will say, two and a half seasons because the 2022 season was cut short. Um, and it was, um, it was actually kind of interesting. And I, I read in in some articles about you know what the criticism was when they announced it, and there there was a question of, um, is is it beneficial to have a women only series or is it segregating women from the rest of motorsport? Um, which was something that Claire Williams, who was the former team boss at Williams and her family used to own Williams before they sold it a few years ago. That was what she said. And then ultimately, I guess she um, rescinded her statement on that. So I don't know if that means she privately changed her mind about it, but publicly she did. Um, 
And Jamie Chadwick, as we mentioned, um, she won each season of the W series, including that one that was shortened. Um, but in 2022, the series went into administration, which is something that we've seen happen um, before in motorsport plenty of times, most recently with um, the F1 team Force India, which went into administration, became another named team, and then ultimately now is Aston Martin. Um, but it apparently they owed 23 million pounds and only had five. 515 pounds in the bank um, and I also saw in one of the articles that I read um, that some of the champ uh, some of the runners up from the championship didn't get paid out their prize money because ev basically every place in um, the W series was guaranteed some amount of money you got a half a million dollars if you won which Jamie Chadwick won each year um, and then the number just kept going down depending on what place you finish but there were a number of drivers um, who mentioned that they did not actually get their prize money, which is unsurprising for a team going into administration, but also a little bit awkward. Um, yeah. And yeah, I, I was I was actually looking. So personally, my favorite W Series driver was Emma Kimmelainen, um, and I was looking at what she was doing now. And apparently, she ended up racing um, in there. There was some some event that she ended up racing in um, in place of Valtteri Bottas, who was not able to participate due to some contract issues with his team Alfa Romeo. So he she ended up teaming up with former F1 champion Mika Hakkinen. Um, earlier this year um so i just thought that was interesting and um it's 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 cool to see that even though these drivers aren't you know currently competing in the you know these series they're still driving elsewhere yeah it is so that's a little bit about the history of women in motorsport getting us to present day um with the you know w series but now we have the f1 academy which i'm mm -hmm. obsessed with because Susie Wolf <laughs> oversees is it. running it, and she's running it. And for again, for those of you who don't know, Susie Wolf is married to Toto Wolf. They are like the unmatched power couple of motorsport. Um, I cannot say more amazing things about Susie. She's the coolest person ever. When I grow up, I want to be her. Um, so this I do know a little bit more about. But F1 Academy was announced in November of 2022. And it is smaller than, you know, the F1 series that we all know and love. There's only five teams. There's three drivers for each team. Um, but it's kind of following the same concept as F1. So, Catherine, what else is there that we should know about the F1 Academy? So this is um, a spec series. So that means that every car is the same, um, which we see in, you know, F2, F3, where they just, they, you all have the same car. Um, and the race weekend format is, I think it might also be almost be a little bit more challenging because you have seven, you only have seven weekends for your, for your season, but you have three races each weekend. Um, and sure, these races are, are, you know, not as long as a Formula One race. They're actually, um, um, they're, they're categorized by minutes rather than laps. Um, so the, the first and third races of each, um, uh, F1 Academy weekend are 30 minutes long. So that means that they'll drive for 30 minutes and then that lead driver after that 30 minute mark will drive one more lap and that's it. And then race two is 20 minutes long, um, same process. The only difference, uh, or the the only other thing is we've got um, basically the same point scales as regular F1 races and the F1 sprint. So those two longer races um, are basically the same points allocation as an F1 race. So you have an opportunity to grab a lot of points, um, which we'll see when we dive into the current standings. Um, you also get two points for pole position, which I think is kind of interesting because that like that's also a pretty big boost, especially if you're you know coming into a situation where you're very close in points. Those two points can mean a lot. Um, and this is a series that is ultimately designed to be the bottom level of the kind of F1 pyramid, where you have F1 at the top is the pinnacle of motorsport. You have F2 and F3 below. And then the F1 Academy is right before, the, uh, but below that in kind of that F4 type of series. Yeah, it's meant to kind of help prepare them to jump to F3, F2, F1 and give them more experience driving in a car, pulling Gs, things like that. But it's giving them that opportunity to start somewhere. 
Exactly. And it, it's getting women the same support that these male drivers have been getting for years. Forever. Equality. Yeah. Imagine that. What a concept. Mm. What's that? What is that? Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, yeah. I, again, I could say a million things about Susie Wolf, but I think it's really important that we highlight her role in this. So she was announced as the managing director of the series in March of 2023. And she's not just like, oh, she got it because she's Toto Wolf's wife. Absolutely not. No. Um, She was a development and test driver for Williams for three years in like the early 2000s, mid 2000s, like 2012 to 2015. Um, She appeared in a number of F1 practice sessions for Williams as well. She's been an ambassador for Mercedes since... 2016 um and she was kind of duh (laughs) well yeah kind of duh obviously but um and she was also a team principal for formula uh, for a formula e team and then she was promoted to their ceo so she's been around motorsport for a while she understands it it's not just like toto's like oh hey Susie, (laughs) go do something with yourself um so i think it's (laughs) i think it's really cool She's been around it, and I think she's a great face for the F1 Academy. Um, yeah, that's my spiel on, on Susie. Do you have anything else you want to add about her? She's like, I get, no. when I grow up, I want to be her because she's so cool. But, yeah. Yeah, she she is is one of the, the greatest modern ambassadors of motorsport for women um, that, that we have along with uh, these drivers um, that, that we're seeing that are, are growing through the sport. Um, we have a little bit of overlap between the W Series and the F1 Academy, which I think is also pretty great. Um, you know, we have uh, four drivers who, who were competing in W Series, and the, the fact that they still have an opportunity to continue racing even even though the W series kind of just imploded on itself, I think it is, is really important. I'm, th- I'm sure that's something that they considered when they were thinking of this driver lineup, which is very diverse, um, very young, um, which is also another interesting point is, is the, these drivers are, you know, kind of like just after teenagers or are still teenagers, which is just a little bit mind boggling to me that they're driving these like super fast cars at this really high level, but it's also really awesome. Um, and then what's also really exciting is that they announced in March of this year that next season, um, the F1 Academy will exclusively take part on F1 weekend. So this season, the only F1 weekend that they've been partaking in is the coming um, USGP in Austin at COTA. Um, but now it will officially be another support series along along with F2, F3, and the Porsche Super Cup. Yeah, which I think is really cool, and I think it's really going to help this series as well. Yeah, it, it, it's it's definitely it's great for exposure. It's also great for the uh, F1 drivers because it puts a little bit more rubber down on the track, which is really important for grip purposes. Um, and we noted, uh, or one of the things that we, we all noticed in, in Qatar um, at, at that Grand Prix last week, uh, or two weeks ago, is, is that... Um, there wasn't a lot of grit because there were no support races at that yeah. race. Um, okay. Yeah. And then there's another like vote of confidence in the Academy or show of support from F1. And it was announced that starting next year, the F1 is going, uh, teams are going to sponsor drivers. So all F1 teams, not just like one here, one there, all F1 teams are going to sponsor a driver on the grid with other sponsors coming to support the remaining five because there are 15 drivers like we were talking about earlier. So I think that's really cool that they're really stepping in and coming behind this and really supporting it. Yeah, I, I think it's it's one of the, the biggest, like you said, votes of, of support for for this series from the, the main series that you're, you know, you're going to have, you know, special liveries that correspond to the current F1 cars. So, you're, you know, you're going to have a Red Bull car, you're going to have a Mercedes car, um, you're going to have an Alpine car um, on the F1 Academy grid. And that's, you know, just going to continue to expand a the brands of the f1 teams but also expand their ability to support other drivers throughout these other series yeah and i wonder too this is just you know random thoughts of emily and i might be wrong but this would also in my mind 
like create that relationship for some of these F1 Academy drivers to maybe get like practice sessions in with an F1 car or work on developing um, laps or testing laps too. Wouldn't you think if they have that relationship? Absolutely. I mean, we already have the, you know, mandated rookie practice sessions in F1. So who's to say that a driver who came out of the F1 Academy, who happens to be a woman, can't be one of the drivers that's going to fill one of those, you know, young driver positions. Obviously, I don't expect that to happen immediately because um, we know we, you know, we understand that there is a hierarchy of, um, of, you know, the the top test, top reserve, top academy drivers um, for each team. Um, but there's there's nothing that says that you can't have somebody who got their start in the F1 Academy ultimately become one of those drivers. Yeah. I, th- I just think that's cool. Like, I would love in my lifetime yeah. to be able to see, like, a woman starting on the grid. I mean, I know we have, like, years to go, but it's really cool. And I think another kind of step in that direction is news coming out this morning that the F1 Academy is teaming up with Champions of the Future Academy to increase female participation in karting. So karting is kind of where you start your motorsport career and you kind of grow through the ranks and it's, you know, F3, F2, F1, if you know, you're lucky and you're one of the 20 to get a seat in F1. But karting is really where it all starts and it's very, very male dominated. And so the F1 Academy is teaming up with kind of these karting circuits to increase female participation, to really grow, you know, grassroots this, if you will, but grow participation at the younger age so that there's more women in motorsport in general, which I think is really cool. Yeah. So this will be a, you know, a mixed gender new karting league is, is what they're really, it's, it's like a junior series to the F1 Academy, but it is mixed gender um, with the Academy supporting three female drivers in each category and helping lower their barrier for entry. Um, it'll have a little bit more um, consistency in chassis. They'll, they'll have, you know, the, 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 the things that the drivers will need to be able to actually get themselves on carts um, will all be a little bit more similar. And there's going to be six doubleheader race weekends in these categories. You'll have the seniors, the juniors, and the minis. And I think it's from ages like 8 to 14 with 36 seats in each um, level. So it, it really is going to give a, a lot of people a lot more opportunity. It'll it'll have a lot more gender equity, I think. And you'll see that a lot more in this junior type of series and that you're ultimately going to see in, you know, the the the, the more major series. Like, I, I personally, I'm not expecting it to be, you know, 50-50 female drivers, male drivers. I know that that would take probably a couple hundred thousand years to get to, um, unfortunately. Um, but I do like the idea of having, like, a larger female presence on the grid. Yeah, definitely. So that's kind of the F1 Academy in its whole entirety. They're, you know, what they're doing, how they're growing. But looking at this season, do you want to give us an update on where they're at this season? Because their season is coming to a close. Like we've said, CODA is their last race, or Circuit of the Americas, the American Grand Prix for F1. That is their last race of this season. Um, So where are they at? Where are they in the constructors? Where are they in the drivers? Can you give us an update there, Catherine? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's a very short season, so to speak. I mean, obviously, 21 races is by no means short, but you're only doing that in seven weekends, uh, you know, of a year. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's kind of like, oh, they're starting. Oh, they're done. And I also think that part of it is, you know, the the kind of the the lack of, you know, marketing is, is we're not really seeing a lot of this stuff unless you're actually there, which we are not in Europe. Um, But they've raced at some pretty cool tracks, including five tracks so far, not including the finale, that have been, you know, tracks that are used in F1. They've raced at Spa, the Red Bull Ring, at Monza, in Spain. Um, So it's, they're they're driving on these these really awesome tracks. Um, And the driver's race is really, you know, coming down to the wire, which is always really exciting and also really great that we're going to have this spectacle, you know, on television 
internationally. And so in the driver's standings, you've got Marta Garcia from Prima Racing, who is leading the standings. Um, you've got Lena Bueller from Art Grand Prix um, in second, and Hamda al Kwabasi, I think I got her name right, um, of MP Motorsport in third. MP Motorsport is actually leading in the Constructors Championship, followed by Prima and then Art Grand Prix. So you've got the top three drivers from the top three teams, um, you know, ready to, to duke it out. And, you know, it, it looks like Marta has a pretty healthy lead until you think about the fact that you've got 25 points available for first over three race or two races. And then the that second shorter race is um, based off the sprint format points allocation. So you still have, you know, 50 some odd points, points available. available for first. Exactly. So so there's really, you know, Garcia has a great opportunity and is probably the most likely front runner and lead, you know, uh, to win the first at Formula One Academy Championship. Um, but we'll see this weekend. And the constructors really is up in the air, a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's very close. MP Motorsport is up um, 372 points ahead of Prima Racing's uh, 349 points. And then Art Grand Prix is not that far behind at 275. They probably won't, you know, Art Grand Prix is not going to get there, I don't think. But they're still like it's it's very close at the top. It's a lot more competitive than what we're seeing right now in F1. I'll give it that. There was no competition. We're forgetting about this season. It's a, it's erased. Remember, we're all gears or all eyes on twenty twenty four. Um, exactly. Anyways, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> I can't think about it anymore. It's super depressing. Um, but for the finale, like we said, um, it is going to be one of the support races for the U.S. Grand Prix in Austin or Cota, like we've been calling it. Um, it's going to be from the 20th to the 22nd of October. I'm personally really excited because it's going to be broadcasted, which none of them have been broadcast. Like we've been saying, you have to go down like this crazy rabbit hole, black hole to try and find like a clip of a highlight. Maybe you find it, maybe you don't. So it's really exciting that they're actually broadcasting it and we can all see it finally. It's yeah, I, th I think that. that Exactly. Like, I, I remember trying to, you know, figure out how to watch um, W Series races and just going down the rabbit hole. And their their website was not easy to navigate to try to figure out how to do any of that. So it was like, it, it was absolutely, you know, a lot harder than it should have been to be able to watch. And I think that was one of the greatest downfalls of the W Series was that you couldn't, like, you couldn't easily find a way to watch it. Um, and if you can't watch it, then you're, you know, you're not getting the response from sponsors. Sponsors aren't getting that boost that they get when they invest in, in teams and in sports. Um, you know, we, you have all these like massive, you know, Rolex banners and zoom banners and, you know, all, all the banners that you see at, at a Formula Lenovo. One race and all the <laughs> logos that you see on cars, Lenovo, um, those, those are all, you know, they're, they're, these, these brands are paying a lot of money for that and you weren't getting the opportunity to see that. So that was why they were just hemorrhaging money and why they ultimately fell into administration. So one thing that the F1 Academy needs to do is make it easier for people to watch the series, even if that just means F1 TV. Like I can live yeah. with F one TV. I have an F one TV subscription. I'm I'm happy to 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 do that. Um, but the fact that it's going to be on in the United States on ESPN is really great because I can watch it on my actual television and not my computer. I can try and like bootleg it onto my TV if it decides to work. I'm still struggling with that, but you know, <laughs> living abroad probably. Mm -hmm. But no, yeah, I mean, it boils down to more eyes, more sponsors, more money, more development. You know, you get more money in, you can invest more money in it, and it can grow. And I think F1 really kind of having it as a support series is really going to help it grow and be a real, Absolutely. a real, you know, series versus, not that W Series wasn't, but they really struggled because they didn't have any eyes on it. If you don't have eyes, no one's going to sponsor you. If you don't have any money coming in, you can't survive. Clearly, they went into administration. So, exactly. Nah. nah. Um, yeah. What a concept. You know, it's, the whole like sponsorship thing is super, super interesting, and in how it works, and like how many, how much like some of those stickers are on an F one car. It's insane. 
Or on an F1 driver, you know, one yeah. of the reasons why, say, your your favorite driver, Sergio Perez, is on the F1 grid is because he has the backing of some major sponsors from Mexico. Um, so, you know, Formula One teams, you know, they, they don't just look at the driver's capabilities, but they also look at the driver's ability to, you know, bring, bring in money. sponsors for the teams and bring in money. Yeah. Like you, you got to make money to make these fancy cars go fast. Motorsport ain't cheap, so you got to bring nope. money. Um, Which is yes. also one of the reasons why it's great that these um, these initiatives are helping lower the barrier for entry. Um, like you know, Lewis Hamilton has told stories about you know how he saved up all his money to buy himself a karting helmet um, yeah. because his family was not you know they, they weren't billionaires like say the Latifi family. Um, so it's it's not easy to get to these upper echelons, especially if you don't have the you know initial advantage of you know the financial backing of your family. Interesting that you would choose uh, Latifi as the rich Canadian and you wouldn't pull out Stroll, but um, I do appreciate I do appreciate the uh, the the callback to Latifi. We haven't talked about him for a while, so uh, yeah. I mean, I th I think the the reason why I picked Latifi over Stroll is Latifi um, obviously was good enough to get to Formula One, but wasn't good enough to stay in Formula One. And at the moment, you know, obviously Lance Stroll with his unknown contract specifications can stay as long as he wants, as long as his dad owns the team. I was going to um, say, but until I, I daddy think that... sells the team, so, yeah. Exactly. Um, so the the point with, with Latifi over Stroll was mostly that, you know, he, he came with some hefty sponsorship backing, which was something that Williams really needed at the time. Yeah, no. Of course, of course. I'm just making a joke because. Oh yeah, yeah. There's, there's two Canadians. I mean, I really could have. Yeah, I, I really could have gone into the uh, whole uh, Mazepin of it all, and the reason why Haas signed Mazepin was because of his daddy's money. Uh, but we don't. We don't need to dive one. into. <laughs> that's a different. That is definitely one. a different episode. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, getting <laughs> back on track here, just. You know, after everything we've kind of talked about and our feelings and, you know, whatever, do you think there should be female drivers in F1 or do you think it's going to ruin the sport? Do you think there should, we should, you know, keep it all women in the um, F1 Academy or, and maybe build that up? You know, what are your thoughts there? Um, I absolutely see no reason why there shouldn't be female drivers having full-time F1 contracts. Period. End, Period. end of discussion. Moving on. Um, but, okay. to, <laughs> but to continue discussing, you know, as I said in our Dutch Grand Prix preview, um, which we're, if you're watching on YouTube, we will link above, um, I like driving fast. So who's to say that there can't be women who can, you know, who shouldn't be paid to drive really, really fast in these really fast cars? Um, and I think... Something that is is really important that I think hasn't really been talked about on purpose is Aston Martin, when they had Jessica Hawkins do her test driving at the Hungaro Ring a couple weeks ago, they made a point to not release her her lap times. I um, mean, they, they, they did that because they didn't want the unfair comparison between her and, say, Lance Stroll or Fernando Alonso in, obviously, two very different cars because she is driving in an older F1 car than what we have currently on the grid. Um, but that said, I was watching the Qatar Grand Prix pre-show and um, Nico Rosberg, our favorite chaos magnet um, on, in the paddock, he made a point to imply that her times that they didn't release were actually really good and were probably close to competitive. So I don't see why we shouldn't have, you know, female drivers on the grid. Yeah, I think it's very, it's not a sport where you're, like, relying on your physical capabilities. I mean, you're pulling Gs, but it's not like you need to be 300 pounds and six foot six to be able to block and tackle. You know what I mean? Like, women's bodies just aren't necessarily built that way. But, yes, you have to be, like, physically able to pull Gs. Everyone is, you know what I mean? As long as you build up those muscles and do all of those weird, like, neck things and, like, go like this and yeah. look ridiculous. Um, but it's driving a car. Like, we all drive cars. We can all do that. Like, I see no issue with it. I don't see why we shouldn't have women in F1. So, 
I, and now that they're like building up interest at you know the junior level and really trying to grow um with the juniors i think you'll have more women interested in it and i think also drive to survive i think is really helping the sport and the female audience like i want to i mean it's probably impossible to get this number but i wonder how many women females across the world got into f1 because of drive to survive like that's something that really drew, drew me to oh it was a massive amount a huge increase and so if that's happening with like little girls you know like i want to do that like mom dad i want to start in karting you know and it's growing the interest i think it's you know we'll eventually get there yeah and back to what you were saying about you know like weight um and obviously you know you're not going to see a female football player who is an offensive lineman in the D1 college level, but you're going to see them as kickers. You're going to see that we most recently saw a, a female um, as a, uh, I think she, she came in on defense safety, as a safety. Right? Yeah. Um, but, but also to, to the point is women biologically tend to weigh less than men. And when it Which comes to weight in F1 car. cars, that's really important. Like the, I you know. know, we don't see it as much as say in, you know, as somebody who used to work in college wrestling, um, we, we don't see the, the, the really stingent weight cuts that you see there, which is a whole other issue in of itself. But these formula one drivers do have to maintain a certain weight in the car um yeah. and you know when they're in season they are making sure that they are not you know going outside of a certain weight um amount and then you see them after every race they go and immediately get out of the car and weigh themselves to make sure that they're not losing an unsafe amount of body weight based on you know water loss and dehydration which we also saw as, as a problem at the qatar grand prix yeah oh my gosh that race man i can't um yeah but again, getting back to F1 Academy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, what do you want to see specifically from F1 Academy? I'm really hoping for better TV coverage. Like moving forward, I love that they're you know broadcasting their uh, season finale. I couldn't think of the word season. Um, I love that they're broadcasting the season finale, but I want to see more. Yeah. Exactly. I, I want, you know, as, as somebody who's a marketer, I want to see more marketing. I feel like, you know, the F1 Academy Instagram doesn't post all that often, and that's probably not their primary primary marketing space. And also not their primary marketing location. We're located in the United States. But at the same time, I want to see more of that, you know, presence of, hey, this is one of the major motorsport series that we have. Um, and I think that we will see that, especially now that the F1 Academy is coming under the F1 umbrella, which is something that um, we did, we don't have this season because we just haven't had that yet. Yeah. And also it's, it would be good too, to have that presence because I, I personally feel like, if you're not actively seeking out F1 Academy or, like, previously the W Series, like, you didn't know it existed. And so having Absolutely. a better online presence, I think, would be helpful to help grow. Again, more eyes, more sponsors, more money, more investment back into it, more growth, the whole thing. Money makes the money makes the world go round. So, um, And also, I think it would be really cool to see what they have to say on their social media. Because we've said this a million times that F1 has the best social media in sports. So they need to, I personally think that they need to like harness that and jump on that train and just, you know, put their foot in the door and, and start making funnies. Cause yeah, I, I think that the the current uh, you know i haven't looked very closely at the the social media side of it but i think that it's very cur currently very driven by the drivers um yeah. obviously the you know the f1 academy doesn't have the same infrastructure and marketing teams as an f1 team does um but i would love to see it get there and i would love to see like these female friend facing memes i think that would be pretty fun yeah exactly well, Kevin, this was really fun. I'm glad that we did this. Yeah, I... The F1 Academy. I, I love this. I'm glad we, we had, had the time. I know this is definitely something that we've been looking at pretty much set, since we set our uh, recording calendar back in August. Um, so I'm really excited that, that we're here. We're actually talking about um, the series because we've got the finale. We will 
do a little bit of a season recap after um, the final um, F1 Academy race. This will not become a half F1, half uh, F1 Academy podcast, but we will be talking about them from time to time, especially now that they're going to be rolled in as one of the sport races. And it's important. Yep, it is. Yeah, like Catherine said, you can look forward to our season recap of F1 Academy coming up uh, after their season ends in Kota. And, you know, now that they are associated more closely with F1 as a support series, news will come out, we'll highlight it, but, you know, we are still very focused on our on our F1 series. So, uh, you can look forward to our COTA preview, which is going to be coming out on Thursday at 9 o'clock Eastern. That's been it for our F101 on the F1 Academy. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>